Greetings, citizen. Justice, benefit, and propriety to you and your clients. Please sit, have tea with me. Begging your great indulgence, I'd like to tell you about the Imperial Ratch Trilogy by Anne Leckie. Ancillary Justice was Anne Leckie's debut novel and became the only novel to ever win the Hugo, Nebula, and Arthur C. Clarke Awards, along with many more. I read it, and citizen, I must be frank, I did not at first see what other people saw in it. I found it confusing and strangely written. The style the author uses alternates between fragments and bloated, clause-heavy sentences. Is this good writing? Are the concepts and world building so great that all these readers and award judges are overlooking the pros? I feel like I'm drinking crazy tea, begging your indulgence. I really do want to understand the appeal as a reader, as an author, but Ancillary Justice was a struggle. No major spoilers, but I'm going to summarize plot points and spoil some world building details, but I honestly believe this is one of the few books where understanding more about them beforehand enhances your enjoyment. Citizen, it's slow. One reviewer praises the writing as clear and muscular, with a strong forward impetus, like the best of thriller writing, concluding that Ancillary Justice was both an immensely fun novel and a conceptually ambitious one. Did we read the same book? I will agree that the world building is excellent. The empire, its bureaucracy, military structure, rights, religion, and customs are convincing and compelling. But thriller this is not. I agree more with other reviewers. One writes, this is not entry-level science fiction. Another describes it as more or less impenetrable to outsiders, presumably referring to outsiders to the science fiction genre, which I am not. And I still struggled, but rather than criticize further, I'm going to do my best to, one, prepare you to understand Ancillary Justice and its sequels, and two, prepare you to enjoy these awards-sweeping books. Because once I got the hang of the prose and the perspective, I enjoyed them, and eventually even found them easy to read. Here's what you need to know in order to enjoy these wonderful novels. First off, don't believe the book jacket. These are not fast-paced books. Technically, there is a deadly serious revenge plot in the first novel, but it doesn't read like a thriller. Neither would I call this space opera, though other people do. Yes, it takes place in space, and yes, there is some shooting, but it's not operatic. It's not dramatic. In fact, most of the characters emote just about as much as Mr. Spock. The Ratch culture is simply not emotive, and the artificial intelligence main character is even less emotional than the humans. But everyone in this surveillance society has a Fitbit up their butt, begging your indulgence. So we're constantly told who is surprised or intrigued or nonplussed. The protagonist literally reads people's blood pressure and cortisol levels mid-conversation. And the action that does exist aligns with the saying about how military life consists of endless stretches of boredom punctuated by bursts of abject terror. When the violence hits, it's fast and furious and well executed, but these are not action-packed books. Instead, expect world building, rights, customs, rules, food preparation, chain of command, and lots and lots of tea. This empire is obsessed with tea. Can't imagine where the author got that idea. The first book, and only the first book, has two storylines that take place many years apart. Now you know. The point of view is weird. It's first person limited, but it reads like first person omniscient because the perspective character is simultaneously a starship, most of the starship's crew, and a battalion of ground troops all at the same time, with the ability to speak, move, and perceive through any of those human bodies at any moment. So when a paragraph suddenly describes what's happening in orbit hundreds of kilometers away from the polite tea party you were just reading about, it's not a mistake. It's part of the central sci-fi element of the novel. First-person omniscient makes for a lot of intrusive sensory experiences. What is criticized in amateur authors as head-hopping. But it's intentional here. The author does know what she's doing, and the sooner you, as a reader, wrap your head around it, the sooner you can appreciate it as a fascinating story element. The next thing you need to know is that this society uses the pronouns she, her for everyone, regardless of what's in their pants, begging your indulgence. 
Said another way, she, her is used as default gender neutral. Someone being labeled she tells you nothing, which is kind of neat because you can reflect on why you picture the character the way you do. And importantly, I think this pronoun choice was less distracting than using they, them would have been, especially for a story about a hive mind artificial intelligence occupying thousands of bodies. Like, can you imagine? It would be a constant struggle in a purely written media to know if they was one person or many. I worry I'm either spoiling something here or I've dramatically missed the point. Like, maybe the reader is supposed to suddenly realize that not all these people are female and have some great revelation about how pronouns are used in our society. But my reaction when I figured out like two thirds of the way through book one, what was going on was simply, huh, that's different. I'm curious to know if the pronoun thing blew anybody's minds, but after watching a few ContraPoints videos, I feel like my mind has been sufficiently blown about that sort of thing, and it just doesn't interest me that much. The review I quoted earlier saying this is not entry-level science fiction is incomplete. The full quote is, this is not entry-level science fiction, and its payoff is correspondingly greater because of that. I think I now agree. Not only do these novels immerse the reader in a fully realized galactic empire with a foreign but interesting culture and language, but the perspective character is this hive mind artificial intelligence who loses most of herself, and we get to see what it's like to have that breadth of being taken away from a person. That's the sort of mind-bending point of view that you don't find outside of science fiction. There are also some absolutely delightful characters and humor sprinkled throughout. Delik and Ziet's chaotic neutral energy is funny, but for me, Sfeen is bay. Readers know what I'm talking about. And that's representative of my experience with these novels. They're tough cookies, but the chocolate chunks are worth it. And not just humor, but insights, emotional moments, or even just weird alien technology. It's very, very cool. And doused in so much tea go into ancillary justice expecting something different, but rewarding, something challenging, but not nearly as challenging as it first appears. Even the grammar that I criticized earlier isn't actually that hard to understand. It's just that my knee-jerk reaction to it is, this is not what my English teacher told me is best. Reader, writer, citizen, transcend middle school grammar. No offense to your English teachers, they have a very hard job, deserve more pay and smaller class sizes, but they didn't win the three largest awards in all of science fiction. I enjoyed this series, more so the later books, not because they're better, but because I grew accustomed to the way the boat pitched and swayed, then I was able to see more clearly the brilliance other people saw and appreciate it more for myself. I leveled my gun, braced myself. Sphine's voice said in my ear, I'd just like to say, cousin, that what you're doing is incredibly stupid. I don't think you're stupid, though, so I suspect you've entirely lost your mind. It makes me wish I'd gotten to know you better.